takes you and it, it like walks you through the sign up. But if you don't want to sign up for the tournament and you just, okay. just want to donate, then there's a QR code at the very end of the form where you can donate any amount you want to the form. Yeah, it's yeah. also on Instagram too. You should follow it. Yeah, follow it. Yeah, I think and it's called Exchange Your Number Four Cause yeah. at the bottom of the sheet. I know, yeah. very creative name, but yeah. All right. yeah. Also, sign ups end Thursday. Yeah. It's the last day you can sign up. All right. so. Thank you. Two claps! Awesome, thanks guys. Yeah. I, I'm sorry, sorry Max. If I, if I, if I, I know I responded to you initially. Yeah. And then I'm like, oh. my email is a mess. Yeah. Don't even try. I'm serious, it's a mess. I'm trying. It's just. I hope it works well. So it's good seeing you guys. I know you two. I haven't seen you in a while. You for a long time. You just last year. But anyway, it's good seeing you. Yeah, I can see you. All right, take care. See you. Thank you. All right, so the video is not going to work the best here. I'm just recording it here again. But anyway, what we're doing is I want to show you guys how to use the work energy. If you are now watching this for part two, I had to stop the video and record it again. So we're going to try. All right, uh, how much work he does. Let's just uh, let's do this really quick. So the amount of work that he does, we can we can solve that uh, pretty simply. Work is equal to F times D times the cosine of theta. For those that were gone yesterday, we spent a decent amount of time talking about the importance of understanding the angle between the force and displacement. So in this case here, would you guys agree the angle is zero degrees? All the force he does, or he exerts, does work. So I just want to find the amount of force that he exerts. It's work uh, divided by distance. He's doing 125 joules, and he's doing that over a distance of two and a half meters. And so when I do that calculation, it turns into a 50 newton force. So if I just look at it in terms of how much energy, how much work he does, and I determine how much distance he exerts that, that force through, I can, I can do that work as we go to force times distance calculation fairly easily. 50 newtons. Uh, what is that? It's about 10 pounds. Okay. So he's using 10 pounds of force to throw that ball. Now, as we as we said, a number of people are like, yeah, the amount of force that the catcher exerts is much greater. Um, using F equals M times A, we can sort of think of that. We can also do this from an energy standpoint. How much work must the catcher do to stop that ball? But it'd be negative. Because if I'm giving the ball energy, the catcher's taking the ball's energy away. So part B is we're saying the work that the catcher has to do is negative 125 joules because the the force that he that the pitcher exerts does not stay with the ball but the energy he imparts to it or the work that he does does stay with it so if the pitcher gives the ball 125 joules of energy from that work the catcher's got to take that away now I, I want to show you that the calculation here could be quite a bit simpler uh, more simply done by looking at how force and displacement are are different things here. The distance here is very small, which means that the force required would have to be really big. And so it's another way of looking at F equals M times A, but not dealing with accelerations. It's dealing with energy. So if the work the catcher has to do is negative 125 joules, and that is equal to a force of application through a distance, and uh, by the way, what is the angle between the force and the displacement here for the catcher? 180, which means that's going to end up being a negative 1 in there. Uh, and so, let's see, the cosine of theta, this one here would be negative 1, because it's opposite direction. Uh, the amount of force that he exerts would be 125 joules divided by 0 0.05 meters, which I think is 2,500 newtons. Is that, did I do the math correctly? Okay. It is the exact same kind of, uh, we get the same end result as we did with F equals M times A, but we're dealing, we're dealing with things that are easily measured. You guys agree it's difficult to measure the time interval during which your egg came to a stop in the egg drop device? It's oftentimes very difficult to measure time, but it's very easy to measure distances. And since distance is one of those factors that we can more easily measure, it gives us a better view of how forces work by looking at it in terms of energy. So 2,500 newtons, much greater than the 50 newtons. How many times greater? If I were to ask you as a factor, could you tell me how many times greater that 2,500 is than the 50 newtons? Just 2,500 divided by 50, right? How many times is it? Mm -hmm. 
it's 50 times greater force, but you notice that the distance is 50 times smaller? That's the idea, right? Force and distance work together to be able to, to do that to do that work. All right, let's move on to this. Uh, there are many times that we're interested in the total work done. If work is a transfer of energy, then the total work would be the total transfer of energy. There's two ways that you can do this. One is to find the work done by each item separately and add them. Pay attention to the sign. Sometimes the sign is positive, sometimes the sign is negative, so pay attention to that. Or you can determine the net force and then use the equation to find the net work. So let me write this up with, uh, with some symbology. We could say that the total work is equal to W1 plus W2 plus W3 plus dot, 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 Wn. I could take any number of forces that are doing work on an object, determine the work done by those forces, add them together. Or I could do this. I could say the net work is equal to the net force multiplied by the displacement, multiplied by the cosine of the angle between those two vectors. They will get you the same answer. Sometimes it's easier to do one versus the other. Which one would you like to try? Which one would you like to try? I'll do the other one. Which one would you like to try? The one on the left or the one on the right? You want to try the one on the right? Yeah. Okay, I'll do the one on the left. So let's go ahead and do it. I'm going to find how many forces would you say are acting on this object? There's technically four. Because, again, if I were to draw an FPD, I have a weight force, I have a normal force, I have a frictional force, and I have a tension force. There's four forces that are acting. So there's, it's possible that four things could be doing work. So if I want to find the total work, I might do the work done by tension. I might do the work done by friction. I might do the work done by the normal force. I might do the work done by gravity. I, those are the four forces that are acting. Two of those are really easy to calculate. I don't need a calculator for it. Which two do I not even have to worry about? The normal and the gravitational force. And the reason for that is that the angle, cosine of 90, uh, cosine of 90 is zero. So I don't care about the weight or the normal force in this particular case because they're perpendicular to the motion. If I want to find the work done by tension, that's easy. That's the force of tension multiplied by the distance that that force of tension acts multiplied by the cosine of the angle between them. Uh, that would be 150 multiplied by uh, 8 meters multiplied by the cosine of 25 degrees. And when I'm done, it's easy. My calculator will give me that. I have, uh, let's see, 15, 150 times 8 times the cosine of 25. I'm getting 1,087. And those of you that were gone yesterday you might say, well, what, the, what would be the units for that? And it'd be the Newton meter or the joule. So 1,087 joules. Now, if I want to find the work done by friction, I have it. It's right there. 95 newtons. Eight, it acts for 8 meters. What do I put down for the angle? Zero. Not zero. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's not 25, it's 180, because the force of friction acts opposite the direction that's moving. So I put down the cosine of 180, and that's a negative one, so 95 times 8 is just uh, 95 times 8 is 760, and it would be negative 760. Now, if I want to find the total work, I just add them. So the net work which is a total transfer of energy, is the sum of these. So it would be 1,087 minus 760. And that number, again, calculator gives me that fairly easily. Uh, that number is 327 joules. And so pretty quickly, I can determine the total energy transfer to that crate. Since energy is a conserved quantity, if I transfer some energy to it, that crate now has 327 joules of energy relative to where it started. 
And of course, that energy would probably be of a certain form. In this case, it'd probably be kinetic. Would you agree? Okay. So uh, we're putting energy, we're putting the work into transfers of energy. All right. If you want to try the one on the right, you can do it. You just have to figure out the net force. I'll give you a minute. See if you can go work through that problem. If you're watching this from home, you should try this problem on your own. Give it a shot. I'll show the answer here in just a few minutes. So let me have you stop for a second if you haven't done this already. I do not care what the tension force is in the Y direction because it doesn't do any work. The only thing I'm worried about here is the tension force in the X direction. I'm just using the F cosine theta to get that tension force in the direction of motion. I'm getting 135.9 newtons. Now, if I want to, if the frictional force is 95 newtons and it's opposing it, would you guys agree that the net force is actually fairly easily calculated? It's just the difference between 135 0.9 and 95, and just subtract those because they're in opposite directions. So 135.9 subtract from that 95, and I get a net force of 40.9 newtons. Now, I want to know the total work, so I'm going to find the total force, multiply that by the displacement. So if I want to get the net work, I could go through and say net work is equal to 40.9 newtons multiplied by the distance of 8 meters. And I'm not even going to use my calculator there. It should be 327. Is, is that what it? You're going to get to the same answer. But there you're going through and doing the uh, doing the net force calculation first. Now I did skip over something. I did not talk about the cosine of theta. What is the angle between the net force and the displacement? In this case, it's still zero degrees. So it's still a positive one there. That's where I get the 327. Which one's easier? It's up to you. Sometimes it's easier to do one versus the other. Both will get you the same answer. Okay, our last thing for today, and I, I, I do work in two parts because uh, sometimes the force is variable. And when a force is variable, I cannot do the same things that I've done in the past because that work with FT cosine theta only works at this constant. So I want to show you guys, um, I want to do this one with you. I was going to give you guys a small activity to do today, but because of the uh, reduced schedule that we have today, it's hard for you guys to do this on your own. So we might try to do this tomorrow if we have time. Um, first, um, Lucas was going to tell me whether or not the force required to stretch that is constant or if it grows as you stretch it. Then that force is changing. So when you stretch the rubber band, you're doing work on it. The question is, is how much work you do. I cannot use F D cosine theta because the force is changing, so I cannot use that equation. So the way that we typically do something like this is I'm going to 
I'm going to measure the force as a function of displacement. Come on up for a second so you guys can see this more closely. Just come on up out of your seat. Okay. So, Lucas, uh, you are correct that the force does change with distance. I'm going to stretch this thing a certain distance, and I'm going to measure how much force is acting to be able to do that. Um, Rita, do you feel like your force calendar is good? Really? No, no, no one make an eye contact right now. Oh. Yeah. All right, I have you eight eye contact. Yeah. All right. I, I'm going to stretch this thing to 50 newtons or 50 centimeters right here. Yeah. And I want you to tell me how, how strong is it there. I'm going to use a force sensor to be able to do that. But go ahead and do it. Now, don't you let it go and take out, take out the. Um, great. Don't take out gray. How much, how many, how many, how many units is that? No. Oh, wait. No, that's a way off. What do you think it was? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> what we're going to do is I'm going to, so when you, if you guys do this tomorrow, I don't know if we're time or not. Uh, I don't even know if we'll be here tomorrow. Um, when you go to do this, uh, I, I'm not going to put the meter stick here because I'm not stretching that thing yet. So that's its relaxed length. I'm going to take this thing, I'm going to put it here, and I'm going to stretch it out to 50 centimeters. And I'm going to measure how that, now so those of you that are looking, or up close here, you can see that that thing is definitely increasing. So that force is growing. And you said to get to 50 centimeters, you said how much? Pretty close. It's about, it's about 19. So you said 30, and then you said 12, so the average is pretty close. That's what you were going for, yeah. Now what I'm going to do, in, in order for me to calculate the amount of work I'm doing, I'm going to measure how the force varies with the displacement. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to create a data table there. So the left-hand side is going to be 0 to 50, and then the right-hand side is going to be how that force changes as we go through that. So I'll show you how to use that graph to go to determine the amount of energy or the work done to be able to do that. Okay. And I'm actually going to go through that. All right, here we go. 10 centimeters. Uh, that force is about 8 newtons. 20 centimeters. That force is about 11 newtons. 30 centimeters. That force is about 13 newtons. 40 centimeters. That force is about 16 newtons. And then 50 centimeters, hopefully I don't let this go over. Uh, 19. Okay. Now, we're going to graph this. I don't remember the numbers. Was it 8? Mm -hmm. 11? Mm -hmm. 14? 13? 13? And then 16, and then 19. Okay, when I go to graph this, I want to use as much of the graph as possible. If I were in an advanced math class, I might be able to write force as a function of displacement, do a fancy integration kind of thing, if some of you know what I'm talking about, because you're in that kind of class right now, right? Is that true? You're, you're kind of, are you guys doing integrations yet? Are you? No. Uh, yeah, but anyway, there are fancy math ways to be able to do this, but we don't need to use fancy math to be able to get these answers. When I'm doing this graphically, though, I do have to make sure that I put things in the appropriate spot. So this is distance, and I want that to be in meters. So I'm going to take that graph, and I'm going to make it be the distance on the horizontal axis in meter, even though I measured in centimeters. The reason for that is energy is newton meters, not newton centimeters. I also want to use as much of the graph as possible. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add... I'm going to take liberty here and add a row, column, I, su I should say, to this so that I can actually have this graph have, what, 10 lines instead of 9, which is my, my bad. I'm going to make this be 0 0.1. This one's 0.2. I'm going to make this one be 0 0.3, 0 0.4. And then I added one of those so I can get that to be 0.5 meters. Now, on the vertical axis, I need to get up to 19. I'm going to try to use as much of that graph as possible. Uh, let's see, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, that's not going to work. 3, 6, 
9, 12, 15, 18, 21. That should work. Force and Newtons. Now, once I get my scale set up, always start at zero. Make sure your scale axes are consistent. Graph it. And then I'll show you how to use that graph to be able to determine the, uh, the work done. You get a very typical elastic curve graph where you have sort of a non-linear relationship here, but uh, that's okay. I'm going to go to uh, construct a line through this, do as smooth of a curve as you can. Now, I can't use work as equal to FD cosine theta because that force is it's, it's, it's changing, I could find the average force. I could go through and say, well, let's just get the average value. But there is a better way to do this, and this is a way of determining what's called the area underneath the curve. And for those that are in a high-level math class where you're learning how to find areas very exactly, it's really just a summation of, of finding area. The area represents something. And I want to take this block, so highlight this block with me here. Sorry, let's try this again. Let's take this block here and consider this block that's just a larger version of that. What are its dimensions? How, how wide is it and how tall is that? So I'd like to know what that is. I'd like to know what that is. Will you look at that graph, your, your graph that you're drawing with me? Tell me, how wide is that? How tall is it? And don't give me values of like it's 20 centimeters wide. You got to use your graph to be able to determine it. What's the width? Did I do that correctly? 0 0.05 meters. How tall is it? Three newtons. It's not. So you might say, wait a minute, I thought these were length measurements. No, that height is actually a force measurement. Now, if I were to take just an area of a, of a square or a rectangle, I would have like the area of this room. Would you guys agree? It might be eight meters by seven meters. It'd be like 56 square meters. I don't get 50. I don't get square meters here. What do I get for the units of this quantity when I take the area? You get meters, which is the joule. So the amount of energy this contains is 0 0.3 times 0 0.15 joules. That block represents a certain amount of work. In this case, that block represents 0.15 joules of work. I have how many of those blocks? I'm going to go ahead and count those. So anything that is at least 50% or more underneath the graph would count. Now in an AP in a in a calculus class, you can find very accurate areas with using infinite sums, but we can get a very close approximation by just doing uh, using a, a simple 50% rule. If it's all the way under the graph counted, if it's 50% or more under the graph counted, that first one I'm going to count. 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. In that first row, I have 10 full blocks of energy. Now I'll go up here, I count that's 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, I count that one. I would not count the next little sliver because it's it's only about a quarter underneath that. So I'm not going to count that. I count this. It's 20, 21, 22, 23, 24, 25, 26, 27. You guys do the same. Finish counting yours. Your graph should be close to mine, and you should get the total number of blocks to be similar to what I have. So take a moment count the rest of yours.
I'm getting 38 blocks. I bet you some of you have 39, some of you might have 37, but all of you are pretty close to that, yeah? It's an approximation, but it's pretty close. Now, if each block represents 0.15 joules, all I do is I multiply the 38 by the 0.15, and so 38 times multiplied by 38 multiplied by 0.15 means that that's about 5.7 joules of work that Abby had to do when you first stretched that thing. You, you did 5.7 joules worth of work to be able to stretch that. So how do you deal with a variable force? Is you create a force displacement graph, you graph that by looking at how that force varies with that, get that area underneath that curve, and you get something called work. And of course, that's the energy that we store in that particular case. Here. Okay? More complicated, but it's doable. When you go to try some homework problems, and you have some for tonight, uh, I'm going to stop the stop the sharing here.